All right, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about some DoD applications for high performance computing. The, the big news for the Army is that uh, we're going to buy a lot of computer or a lot of <laughs> a lot of computers, but a lot of uh, helicopters in the next 25 to 40 years. Um, there's a program called Future Vertical Lift, uh, FVL, and we're going to replace the entire U.S. vertical fleet of helicopters over the next 25 to 40 years. That's a big deal. The Army has way more helicopters than the Air Force has airplanes, and those helicopters are more expensive than the Air Force's airplanes. So talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars of taxpayer money. So the DOD is all about risk reduction these days. And one of the areas of risk reduction is high performance computing, modeling, and simulation to make sure there are no surprises in these new rotorcraft. Another thing they're doing for risk reduction is a precursor science and technology demonstration program called Joint Multi-Role Technology Demonstrator. And the idea here is to take some of the key technologies in these new rotorcraft and build something and fly it and try and make sure everything works before you commit billions of dollars to, to, to these new designs. So as part of that, there was a paper study uh, that started a couple of years ago where four designs from four aircraft companies, Karam, AVX, Bell, and Sikorsky Boeing, were presented for different configurations of rotorcraft. And you can see they're all very different. None of these have ever been flown or tested before. And our Army um, uh, HPC modeling and simulation software, actually, we got these paper designs. We got the CAD about a year ago, and we had two months to develop meshes, do the calculations, and turn around some analysis of these four uh, configurations. So the, the, the big news for, for me and for our Army lab was that those CFD analyses had a big role in the down select from four to two. Uh, Bell and the Sikorsky Boeing one are going forward. And that's the first time that HPC has really ever been used in a, in a real acquisition program like this before. So what I'm going to tell you today is kind of how we got to the, the capability of doing this type of modeling and simulation, where we are right now, and then where we're headed in terms of the future role of high performance computing. Um, so where we started was uh, the DOD High Performance Computing Moderniz Modernization Program has a program called CREATE, which started about seven years ago. And the idea is to uh, develop high fidelity modeling and simulation to reduce risk, uh, reduce cost, and enhance safety for new, new DOD acquisitions. There are a number of uh, different uh, topic areas for CREATE, a number of different codes that are being developed. I was hoping that Roy Campbell from the HPCMP could be here to tell you a little bit more about the big picture. I have one of these projects. It's called DOD High Performance Computing Modernization Program Create Trademark AV Helios, and that keeps the lawyers happy. Uh, from now on, I'm just going to refer to it as Helios through this presentation. So the idea of Helios is to is to model rotorcraft error mechanics. Um, there's a number of really important problems that you don't see in fixed wing. The, the main one is you can see these white lines here when the atmospheric conditions are right. The tip vortices, which are rapidly spinning air, um, you actually get a low pressure in the middle and you get some condensation. So that's how you can actually visualize the tip vortices in this photo. The vortex wake system is critical in the aerodynamic performance of the vehicle, and it's really hard to compute, really hard to analyze. Um, so with Helios, we want to get high fidelity simulations of the rotor wake. We also have to uh, put grids and, and, and flow solvers around complex geometries. These rotorcraft are pretty geometrically complex. Uh, the rotor blades are also flexible, so there's aerostructural coupling. And we want to automate this process as much as possible and have it available to real design engineers, not just CFD specialists. So that's a pretty tall order. Uh, what I'm going to do next is describe four key things about our Helios software that, that make it different from other computational fluid dynamics codes. These are mostly things that we developed uh, as part of Helios. The first thing is the grid system. Uh, Cartesian meshes are great for CFD. They run really fast. They're high order accurate. 
everything you ever want. You can do adaptive mesh refinement. However, it's really hard to, to, to wrap that stair step of, of Cartesian grid around a complicated real geometry. So we don't do that. We actually use uh, unstructured grid methods around the fuselage, around those complex geometries, triangular surface meshes, uh, moving to uh, prisms and, and tetraheater in the volume. But we only take those near-body grids, we call those near-body grids, out a little ways, and then we transition to the Cartesian mesh, which is a lot more efficient and accurate. Uh, the information gets passed between the two grid systems in an overlap region, and we do interpolation between the meshes there. The big trick is trying to do that interpolation in an automated way and how to make it really fast and efficient on parallel computers, because these uh, meshes have relative motion, so you really have to do that connectivity and interpolations almost every time step. Well, at every time step. So that's a big deal, and we've come up with some really quick ways to do that in Helios. So the first thing was dual mesh. The next is Cartesian adaptive mesh refinement. If you want to capture those vortex, those helical vortex wakes below the rotor, you got to refine the mesh to, to get the details of that. So we borrowed Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory Samurai software. So Samurai was initially developed to track blast waves moving through, you know, the air through surfaces. And we figured, uh, through, through volumes of air. And we figured that we can use that same technology to track the motion of these tip vortices from Rotorcraft. So we uh, plugged in Samurai. The idea here is this is a cross section of one of those rotor vortices that's uh, vorticity contours here. So the air spins round and round here really fast. We identify those on the mesh. We uh, uh, add more grid points. We continue to do that until we get the resolution that we need. The thing that makes sca Samurai scale so well on parallel computers is that every time you add another level of mesh, you take those mesh points and you look for the processor that has the least amount of work, and you put them there. So we're continually adding and subtracting mesh points, but also continually balancing the load. And uh, we've done studies for uh, low numbers of processors. It's about a 3% overhead for all this mesh motion. Livermore has tested Samurai on over 100,000 processors with good scalability. So. Uh, a movie is worth a, thou oops, a thousand words, so I'm going to show a movie of how this works. Um, so what you're seeing here is a V22 Osprey rotor, and we're going to look at, uh, you can see the mesh adapts around these tip vortices, and this is the, these helical vortex wakes that you see in the, the previous photo. Um, the movie is going to show this thing evolving in time. The cutting plane is attached to the rotor blade, so the cutting plane is going to look like it's not going to move. But you can see as the rotor wake evolves, the mesh, we add and subtract mesh points to capture those vortices. And that's all done in a very automated way with very low computational overhead. And, and that, is, that was the, cre the key critical component to doing these rotorcraft calculations. And that's what Rupak and I worked on for many, many years in the 1990s, and we never quite got there, but, the, but this was what did it. Um, another thing is that helicopter blades are flexible. And I have to play this movie outside the uh, PowerPoint because it crashes my PowerPoint, but um, hopefully we'll get this going. So this is a, uh, a McDonnell MD900 rotor, and you can see the flexibility of the rotor blade as it goes around. Again, we're an observer tied to the, to the rotor, so it doesn't look like it's spinning, but we're going around with that rotor blade. Half the time it's going into the wind, half the time it's going with the wind. And you can see that the pilot control inputs are here at the root, but there's a lot of elastic motion at the tip. And obviously when the shape changes do the elastic motion, the aerodynamics change. When the aerodynamics change, the shape changes, so it's a very tightly coupled problem. This was a second key thing that we really had to get right in order to do real helicopter rotor. Um, okay, back to the PowerPoint. 
Okay, the, the final thing I'm going to talk about in, in this Helios software is software architecture. We've got, I don't know, about 15 people working on this software. It's really hard to have everybody work together well. It's also really hard to continually update and extend the software. So we use a Python object-oriented integration framework. It's lightweight. It only has a few hundred lines of code in the main execution sc script. It's minimal overheads for implementation on parallel computing. Python is really the go-to kind of glue language to bring together uh, multiple codes in multiple languages. And uh, you can wrap the uh, individual modules in, in Python wrappers to make them object-oriented. They plug into very well-defined interfaces. And each of these component modules does a task. We, we have a near-body flow solver here, off-body flow solver, the, the interpolations, domain connectivity, the computational structural dynamics. The key thing about Python, though, is that we can define these interfaces. Here for the near-body solver, we actually use three different near-body solvers, and you can choose whichever one you want. But they all use the same plugin. They all use the same interface. And the idea, and well, so is, uh, University of Wyoming's NSU 3D, and then two NASA codes, Overflow and Fun 3D. Five years from now, we're not going to use any of these near-body solvers. We're working on a next generation of flow solvers that are more accurate and more computationally efficient. The idea is that they will plug into that same interface uh, seamlessly. So it really, you, you have to have an architecture like this if you're going to continually evolve the software without having to rewrite it all the time. So that's another big component. Uh, just to show how that works, I said we had three or a number of near-body solvers. This is a, a multi-flow solver paradigm for the CH-47. We use NASA's overflow code on the rotor blades. We use the unstructured code on the fuselage and the Cartesian adaptive grid in the far field. You put all that together and you compute the rotor weight behind a CH-47 and it looks like a, a mess, but the details here are really important and it's a very complicated aerodynamic flow field. Boeing has actually used Helios to perform full flight envelope modeling for the CH-47 with this technology. Uh, another example of where we are, um, I can't show you those four designs, the results for those four designs in the joint multi-rotorcraft uh, tech demo. Um, the, the good news is that those are really important calculations. The bad news is they're so important that the companies won't let us show any of the results from that. So what I can show, though, is Sikorsky, uh, before JMR, they developed their own demonstrator of the X2, which has coaxial rotor on the top. That's two rotors turning opposite directions. It has a propulsor on the tail for forward uh, flight propulsion. And we did the, uh, uh, actually, the Sikorsky engineers, Alan Egolf and Ed Reed, did both coaxial rotors turning, the fuselage and the propulsor all integrated together in time accurate calculations with Helios. This is about 50 hours on 1,000 processors. So it's not a small calculation, about 400 million mesh points. Um, but you can really see, you get the rotor wake system from the main rotors, the interaction of the two rotors, the interaction of the rotors with the fuselage, the propulsor interacting with the airframe, and the main rotor wake uh, interacting with the propulsor and the propulsor wake. Um, to give you an idea of what the engineers use this kind of data for, other than making pretty pictures, which is nice to look at, is uh, uh, here's the main rotor unsteady lift. These rotors are going over the fuselage. Uh, you get a four per rev every time the rotor goes over a fuselage, the lift changes. So you get a vibratory force here. Uh, the fuselage lift changes. When the rotor goes over the fuselage, it pushes it down. So this is uh, for one rev. You get another four per rev signal here. Uh, and more importantly, in the propulsor, the propeller, it's a six-bladed propeller. So for each rev, you get six uh, pulses as you interact with the airframe, but you also superimposed on that get the main rotor wake hitting the propulsor and giving another vibra vibrational component there. So all this is a really big deal, but you got to know whether you're going to hit a resonance in something and the whole airframe is going to shake apart before you fly it, and that's the real key. Um, 
uh, incidentally, you can tell that these calculations were done by Sikorsky folks because all the numbers here are normalized and they won't tell you what they are. So it's a, it's a proprietary secret here. But the main thing is the Helios simulations provide unique capabilities for modeling interactional aerodynamics between the coaxial rotor system and the propulsor. And this has really been the goal of this CREATE project for development. Uh, another thing we can do, we've done a lot of simulations of wind farms and wind turbines with Helios. A wind turbine is just like a helicopter, but instead of putting energy into the air, you're taking it out. But it has a similar vortex wake system. Oops. Let me see if I can run that. Anyway, but we get the, the high fidelity uh, rotor wake for each individual turbine. This is 48 turbines in a wind farm. And we get all the interactions with the high fidelity aerodynamics of, of all the turbines with each other. So that's a big deal. We also hooked up Helios to NCAR's weather research and forecasting model, WARF. And we can get the atmospheric gusts coming into the wind farm, which are also important for the wind turbine performance. Um, so, but, but I, you know, this is really cutting edge technology for wind turbine air mechanics modeling. Just last week I was over at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and I was talking with biologists about uh, bird deaths for wind turbines. And we're actually going to look at the high fidelity flow field and the rotor wakes and look at what happens when birds fly into the flow fields. Everybody thinks that the, the, uh, the, the wind turbine blades hit the birds, but that's not usually the case. For birds and bats, they actually fly into that disturbed air and they get flung around and that, that's uh, also a, a big cause of mortality. So we're going to use the aerodynamic flow field to investigate that. Uh, okay, so that's the, where we are. Now I want to shift gears and talk about where we're going. What are we doing with parallel scalability? What are we doing to take advantage of, of new hardware that's coming online? So if you look at uh, CFD in general, the ideal problem is you're solving the Navier-Stokes equations in a big volume where you take the the, the big cube and you partition it into smaller cubes. Each cube goes on one processor. You got nearest neighbor communication. Everything scales perfectly. That's ideal. Um, however, uh, in reality, the size of these cubes matters. The, the volume of the cube is the amount of computation you have to do in each processor. You want that to be high. The surface area is the communications. You want that to be low. And for most CFD problems, you know, you've got five variables you're solving per, per node, and we're doing half a million or a billion, or, I mean, 500 million or a billion mesh points. We really want to have one to two gigabyte per processor, and that's, that's a big deal. And I know memory is hard to come by on these big parallel systems. Um, other way, and, and you, you obviously, you don't want to make these cubes too small or the communications overwhelm the, the computation. Other things that make scaling non-ideal, some of these cubes may be on the, on the boundaries. Some of them may be in these overset uh, interpolation regions. Some of them might be on the boundary of the fluid and the structures. All those things mean those processors have more work and the whole problem doesn't scale as well. So the question is, what can we do to get around some of these issues and how can we move from 1,000 to 5,000 processors up to a million processors? And that's a big challenge. Um, I'm going to talk about four strategies briefly here. Uh, the first strategy to do that is we need to overlap the execution of our flow solvers. We've got multiple flow solvers, which right now we run sequentially. They don't all scale as well on the same number of processors. So if we overlap them with asynchronous communications, overlap the fluid and structures, we can speed things up. How much can we speed them up? Probably not a whole lot, maybe a factor of two, something like that. So maybe we'll be up to 10,000 processors or maybe 20,000. But overlapping these computations is not going to get us to a million. A better strategy for getting to a million is something we're working very hard on in our, my laboratory. It's instead of just parallelizing in space where you break the, the big cube up into small cubes, it's parallelizing in time as well. And you can take the whole time problem and split that up on multiple processors as well as the space problem. And if you do that, you can get a lot of processors used. It's even better with rotorcraft problems because rotors in straight and level flight are inherently periodic. Every time you see the same thing as you go around each rev. And for a periodic problem, 
you can use Fourier decomposition and time spectral formulation to really make this time decomposition work well in parallel. And if you think about it, if you get a thousand processors in space, which we do all the time, that's easy, and we demonstrated this temporal decomposition for a thousand processors in time, that's a million processors. And we are ready to push the button on scalability studies for a million processors right now. The problem is we need to find a computer where we can do that. Uh, I'm talking to the folks at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, trying to get some time there. And we're also looking at doing scalability studies on the DOD machines this summer. But I think very, very soon we should be able to demonstrate large numbers of processors up to a million or more. The other issue is what about heterogeneous hybrid hardware? There's a lot of new machines and they've got CPUs, GPUs, uh, mic chips, all sorts of things. How are we going to design our codes to run effectively on these new architectures. And my nightmare is that I've spent all this money to write all the software and we're going to have to rewrite it every time we come up with a new architecture. And that's a problem. Uh, a good way to get, to get around that or mitigate this problem is, uh, is uh, domain-specific languages. And I borrowed this slide from Pat Hanrahan and Alex Aiken at Stanford. And the idea here is that you have a domain-specific programming language that automatically maps parallel CFD flow solvers to exascale computing architectures. So, and, and Pat Hanrahan has developed a code called LIST. It's a high-level language for solving partial differential equations. The idea is you write your software in LIST, and then LIST will map it to whatever architecture you're talking about. And that way, we don't have to rewrite our software. Also, we're programming in a higher-level language, so you're more productive and less chance for bugs. So that's a big deal. Um, Stanford has a, a, a DOE grant called PSAP, and they're writing all their PSAP codes in list, their SU squared code. That's a big deal. I think it's great. The question is, why am I not using it in my government lab? Well, the problem is the standards. List is not a standard. If I write it in list and somebody comes out with someone, something else later, then I'm, I'm kind of, uh, law, you know, have to rewrite everything anyway. So it's a great research project right now for domain-specific languages. What I would like to see is some sort of a standard where we could all use similar uh, standards for, for writing our software. The other thing I wanted to talk about, this is the last thing, is big data. Uh, yesterday we heard some presentations that were talking about the need for a lot of data and a lot of storage and how are we going to deal with all that. In my end, I'm running away from big data as fast as I can. Um, our ability to produce data is going up exponentially. Our ability to analyze it and move it around is going up maybe linearly at best, but it's kind of a losing battle. So what we did with Helios is we decided we're not going to have to deal with big data. We've got to get rid of it. Um, with these big three-dimensional si simulations, you may have a billion mesh points. and if you want to post-process that, every time step or every degree of, of rotation for 360 degrees, you've got to write out that whole big 3D data set with a billion mesh points. If you get 360 of those files, there's no way you can move it uh, over the internet, there's, or over the, uh, the networks, there's no way you can read it into a machine for post-processing, for graphics post-processing. So that's a big problem. So what we did is we had Kitware, who makes Paraview, uh, develop a plug-in module that goes into the Helios framework that has access to the data at runtime. It forms two-dimensional cutting planes, two-dimensional isosurfaces, particle traces, does all the visualization stuff at runtime, writes out two-dimensional data extracts, and we can move the 2D data around. So we're uh, doing our, our graphics and our, our post-processing on the fly, and that way we uh, don't have to write out a lot of data. Uh, this was done as part of an Army SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research Grant at Kitware, and I had to convince the Army lawyers that it is possible to give one of these small business grants to a company that is uh, developing open source software and not selling anything, and that was kind of tricky. Okay, so finally here, we've got rotor air mechanics challenges. We've got the rotor weight capturing. We're doing pretty well with that. We can do full vehicle complexity, doing pretty well with that. If we get this parallel in time working, we can reduce the turnaround. What's next? And what's next is design. Uh, you know, we've got to be able to design these rotorcraft. 
um, and we have to be able to use exascale computing for that. So if we reduce the turnaround and we enhance the automation, we should be able to put these tools in the hands of designers for those rotorcraft that I showed you earlier. And the product is a well-validated error mechanics modeling and simulation tool based on uh, high fidelity computational fluid dynamics. The payoff is reduced time, cost, and risk for air advanced aircraft development and safe and reliable aircraft for the DOD. And I, I came up with a, uh, a picture that, that kind of summarizes where I'd like to see this go. It's a, a shot from the Iron Man 2 movie. I don't know if you remember that, but Tony Stark gets up at this holographic computer uh, table and he talks to the computer and interactively redesigns his Iron Man suit. And he's telling the computer to optimize this, do this, do that, change things. So that's the automation part. And my imagination says behind the scenes that computer is running on exascale computations of high fidelity analysis tools and putting that all into the mix. So that's what I would envision for a future of rotorcraft design using these tools, uh, design using fully automated high fidelity modeling and simulation and automation here with uh, that type of interactivity using multi-point adjoint based optimization. And, and I'll leave that image with, with you guys and. We'll see whether we get to that before uh, I, I retire, uh, which I think we probably will not, but hopefully long after that. All right, thank you. Any questions?